So I wanted to talk today about investment banking, uh, which is uh, a subject of uh, some interest around here. Um, but first, I, I, uh, I thought I would. Uh, there's been so much news. I, I want to just briefly comment about what's going on uh, in the world <laughs> today with our um, financial crisis. Uh, notably, I, I think that this is the. Uh, it could be the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression, uh, and uh, as evidence of that, we're seeing a lot of talk about what. Changes should be made, and I think it reminds me of the very basic fact that we live in a financial world that was created in the wake of the Great Depression. Uh, so many of our financial institutions were created in the 1930s uh, because that was a time when everything was being shaken up, and uh, it was a time when people were willing to consider something really different. Uh, if you just look at back where various of our institutions, when they were created, it's most likely to be in the 1930s. Uh, we are not yet at such a crossroads. The financial situation is not as bad as it was in the 1930s, but it's getting bad. And as a result, uh, we're starting to see um, proposals for big change. Notably, uh, on Monday, the Treasury Department. Under Secretary Henry Paulson, uh, announced a proposal for fundamental change in our financial markets, uh, and this proposal, if implemented, might be the biggest change since the uh, Great Depression. Uh, however, uh, the news are calling it dead on arrival. <laughs> uh, it's unlikely that the Paulson proposal. Will be implemented, uh, partly because it's it's being proposed by a Republican administration, well, not just Republican, a, just a, an administration that's coming to an end, and we're having an election. So this uh, Paulson proposal probably has very little chance of being implemented as is, but it's put it's put in uh, to change the discussion. Uh, and it's, it's going to be talked about a lot, and I, I suppose it will influence what happens. The, the interesting thing is that the next president of the United States will likely have a mandate for big changes. Uh, so maybe it's just as well that Fabozzi and Al are slow to do a second edition of their book, because if they got it out this year, it would be a bad year to get it out, because everything is changing. Uh, so I, was, I, I studied the Paulson proposal carefully. Since I'm, write, I'm writing a New York Times column about it, which will appear Sunday, uh, and reading the various commentaries about the proposal, uh, I had the impression that not many of them are very thinking very deeply about it. They're, they're typically they like to talk about the politics of it <laughs> uh, and this thing that it's dead on arrival or it's uh, someone said it's an amateur re amateurish proposal. All the groups that stand to win or lose from it are all figuring out what it does to them, and they're taking their positions out of self-interest. So I wanted to write something that was more um, perspicacious, if, <laughs> if I could manage that. Um, the interesting thing is, actually, we, everyone calls it the Paulson proposal, but um, it was apparently mostly written by a young man who was in his early 30s. You may not consider that young, but. <laughs> I think that as young, he could have taken this course from me ten years. Ago. Actually, he didn't go to Yale. I, I looked it up. He went to American University, uh, both undergraduate and his, his name was David Nason, uh, undergraduate, and then he got a law degree at American University, uh, and then he just went to work for the government. As far as I know, he doesn't publish. Uh, he's not in the newspapers, but he's gotten the ear of the Treasury Secretary. And they spent many weekends together figuring out what should be done about the system. Uh, and they wrote up a proposal, uh, which I, I like many aspects of it. Actually, uh, it's an interesting proposal. Uh, but uh, but the, the, it's not so much what's in the proposal as it is that this is a time uh, for reconsideration. Um, what, uh, 
Well, one I interesting thing that they proposed is that we should have what they call objectives based regulation. Um, I'll write, if I can find a piece of chalk. So, uh, so, okay. So we have, um, this is David Mason and Henry Paulson. Although it's not signed by them, it's signed by the Treasury. Uh, so the Treasury, it's called a blueprint. A blueprint for reform of our financial regulation. Uh, and um, it's, it's built around uh, what they call objectives based regulation. That means that uh, the, the different regulators should each have their own objective. And so they have a three part proposal. It would be a market stability regulator, uh, which would uh, make sure that the markets don't uh, freeze up on us. We don't have the systemic crisis. There would be a prudential financial regulator. And then three, there would be a business conduct regulator. So that's the, uh, the main part of the proposal. And so what they're doing is uh, emphasizing the different uh, objectives of, of regulators. Market stability is going to be the Fed. Uh, but, uh, but it's not just banking. They want it to be uh, – the Fed's role would be broadened so that it's not just a banking regulator. It's the whole financial system. It's supposed to be maintaining the stability of the system. Uh, and then the prudential financial regulator is uh, supposed to regulate uh, – it's supposed to aim at uh, – I, uh, protecting the U.S. interest in various institutions that are guaranteed by the government, such as uh, banks that are federally insured uh, or uh, uh, enterprises that have government guarantees or apparent government guarantees like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then the business conduct regulator is supposed to regulate uh, uh, well, uh, what I th saw is that it was, it would uh, be aimed at consumer protection. That it would um, make sure that businesses are uh, are protecting individuals. Uh, so I found this uh, interesting because it calls to mind some of the problems we had with the subprime crisis. One very important problem was in the U.S., we have regulation divided up in crazy ar archaic ways. Different agencies were formed at different times and they have specific missions. Uh, and for example, we have the Office of the, C Office of the Controller of the Currency, uh, the OCC, was founded in 1863 to supervise national banks, but it only supervises national banks. <laughs> Well, why not state chartered banks or why not credit unions or other things? Um, well, it's just an accident of history. So, um, what, um, uh, what these people are proposing is that we merge various agencies so that, uh, and, and d define new agencies of the government that are separated by these different um, objectives. Uh, so, an objective defines an, uh, an agency, a regulatory agency. Uh, so, uh, so what uh, they want to do is merge the OCC and the OTS merger. That's one of the proposals. But I wonder why they don't carry it further, but th that's, that's the thing they emphasized. The OCC is Office of the Controller of the Currency regulates national banks. 
the OTS is the Office of Thrift Supervision. It regulates savings banks. So we put the two together. That sounds sensible, I guess. Why are they separate? Um, and th various other things that they talked about had that form. They want to merge uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. All right. The Securities and Exchange Commission is the principal government regulator for securities. They make sure that everything is on the level and working right. They, they help prevent fraud, misrepresentation, manipulation of information in stocks and bonds. The CFTC is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and it regulates our futures markets. Um, there's been over the years, a lot of turf battles between the SEC and the CFTC because it's sometimes unclear whether something is a security or a future. For example, when they started trading stock index futures, these, both these agencies thought it was in their turf because it involved both stock indexes and futures. Anyway, uh, Paulson is proposing merging these. Uh, that makes sense, and it seems like uh, Getting rid of some of this division of regulatory agencies is very beneficial. Uh, and it, the division is what hampered regulators from, from dealing with the financial subprime crisis. So people knew that a lot of bad loans were being made, or loans were being made to people who shouldn't be getting them. Low income people were being given adjustable rate mortgages with very low starter rates, called teaser rates, that would be raised in the future. And they were given them with in such a way that after the rates ra were raised, they likely couldn't afford to pay the mortgage anymore, or they'd be under great stress in trying to do so. So a family that bought a house, a low-income family buys a house, they can barely afford it. Then the rates go up on them. The parents would have to take out second jobs to try to, you know, they're just going to, they're just going to go bankrupt when that happens. So it was, uh, in some cases, unethical, and it was plainly a problem. And yet the regulatory agencies in the U.S. weren't stopping it. Uh, another reason why the regulatory agencies weren't stopping these problems was because they often saw their mission in different terms. So when I gave a talk at the OCC uh, in 2005, I was asking them about why aren't you policing these mortgages? And their first answer was, well, you have to remember, we were set up in Abe Lincoln's day to manage the national banks. Uh, we're, that's our mission. W w I, I'm a, I may be overstating their answer, but I got that flavor from them. That you want us to go out and protect consumers. Well, of course, that's a nice mission. But that's not our mandate. So, uh, uh, so uh, I think that what Paulson and Nason uh, uh, want to do is to create a separate business conduct agency that is aimed at consumer protection, and so it would be working parallel with these other agencies. To, uh, to but their job would be to represent the consumer, and that sounds like a good idea to me. Um, the thing I stressed in my column was the market stability regulator, which is the Fed. What they want to do is expand the uh, actions of the Fed so that they're not just – you can describe the Federal Reserve or any central bank traditionally as a banker's bank. Remember I told you the story of how the first – the Bank of England was the first central bank, and it made banks keep deposits at the Bank of England. So in other words, the banks were like customers of the Bank of England. They had to keep deposits there, and the Bank of England watched them to make sure that they were behaving responsibly and had authority over them because it, um, it had uh, market power. Well, the Fed is like that now, um, but what uh, Paulson and Nason want to do is make it more than a banker's bank. They want it to be a bank for the whole financial system. And that's what's already happening. Uh, in fact, it's just happening rapidly as we speak. I mean, in this last month, things have changed. The, the Fed has never given loans to anyone other than a depository institution, that is a bank, 
until last month, and except they did so in the Depression. There was this long gap. In the 1930s, uh, the, the Fed was making loans to private companies that were not banks, and then they stopped doing that until last month. Uh, and they created the, uh, I mentioned it last time, the term securities lending facility and the uh, primary dealers credit facility, which are lending outside the banking system. And so uh, what Paulson wants to do is make that official, that the Fed is no longer just a central bank. It's a market stability regulator. This is going to be very controversial, <laughs> but I think it's a good thing to raise. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is the trend anyway, and I think we're going that way. Uh, the, the problem is that in a modern financial economy, we have so much instability, which is already built into the system, that, uh, that uh, we have to we, we rely on something like a central bank uh, to do things that, uh, that help stabilize markets. Uh, and so I think that we're probably going that way anyway. And uh, I think that in the next presidential administration, we'll see an expansion of the role uh, of the Fed. Uh, I wish the Fed had behaved better in the recent crisis, in the sense they didn't seem to recognize the bubbles that we had in the stock market in the 90s and the housing market in the 2000s. And if there are market stability regulator, you'd hope that they could do a better job. Uh, but. Uh, they're what we have, and I think that, that we should probably uh, uh, give them uh, the authority to do that job, and I think that's what we need to do. So I was generally positive about uh, their the Treasury proposal, but um, another thing that they want to do, which has uh, been talked about for some time, yes. Yeah, so you, he asked, why, why do the news media think that the crisis is already over? Uh, and secondly, why do they think we can prevent, <laughs> right? Is that a paraphrasing? Uh, I don't know if the news media are concluding anything, but you do see, we have seen over recent years, we've seen a lot of um, uh, suggestions that the turning point is just around the corner. <laughs> and so, uh, and the news media report that. I think there's a bias towards optimism uh, by in among business economists generally, or business people in general. You know, it's not considered good form to say, I think we're about to have the crisis of confidence and the whole house of cards is going to collapse. So it's also not, uh, you know, it's generally not in a business person's interest to suggest that. So we're all instinctively trying to promote each other's confidence. And that's what business people do. They, they carry it a little further than that. Uh, I, was, uh, I was asked to uh, be on uh, uh, the Quidlow and Kramer, uh, Quidlow and Company <laughs> show. Um, uh, I guess it was two nights ago. I turned them down, but they wanted to put me on opposite the, the CEO of um, Coldwell Banker, uh, and uh, who, is, uh, who is claiming that the crisis is just about to end. And so I did a little research. I would be thinking I still might go on the show, but uh, I, um, I looked up uh, CEO of Coldwell Banker. Well, I found that there was another CEO. This is a, a broker, a real estate broker's firm. There was another CEO a year ago who was on TV, just exactly a year ago, saying, I think this is the best time ever, or the best time in at least 10 mm -hmm. years to buy a house. <laughs> and he said, uh, the uh, inventory is high. Uh, the market is bottoming out, uh, and so on. Uh, he was spectacularly wrong, but I notice he's also no longer CEO. Uh, so these things happen. So uh, th there is a general bias. On, on the other hand, I have to respect these people that usually financial crises end okay. They, there's, there, there are repeated scares, and usually it's all right. Like we had a big scare in 1998. Uh, it started with the Asian financial crisis. 
and then it spread to Russia, and there was this terrible collapse in Russia in 1998 uh, when the government couldn't pay its debts. And then that spread to the U.S., and people were very fearful. But the Fed under Alan Greenspan was very quick to respond, and the whole thing didn't turn out to be anything so bad. The, the Fed, again, did like what it's doing now. It rescued uh, this company called Long-Term Capital Management. Uh, but your, your question about whether we can prevent this kind of thing in the future is a deep question. And I think that the problem is that our financial markets are inherently somewhat unstable. When we start thinking up really important new ways of doing financial business, they start to grow and they get huge. They get bigger and bigger before you know it. And it, it, it's amazing how things can suddenly grow, and then nobody understands them. So there's a vulnerability. Uh, I was just uh, got the latest number. Do you know how much credit default swaps there are outstanding? According to the Bank for International Settlements, there are now $52 trillion worth of credit default swaps outstanding. $52 trillion. Well, the GDP of the United States is only $14 trillion. So how can there be $52 trillion? Of, and these things only came in in the last 10 years or so. Um, and so I called a bank, uh, an economist at the BIS and said, can you please explain it to me? Where is this $52 trillion coming from? Uh, and uh, I got a note from him. I'm still trying to figure it all out. But that's what happens. The system performs very well, and then it uh, becomes vulnerable. Nobody understands all of it. So that's, that's the problem. Uh, and uh, the other side of it, though, is uh, there was a recent study that looked at financial crises and compared countries that have had financial crises with countries that haven't. And the conclusion was that countries that have experienced financial crises are generally more successful, on average, over the long haul, than countries that haven't. Uh, and so, in, in that sense, a financial crisis is a sign just that you're moving with the times, uh, and you know you, you you're making a lot of money, <laughs> and so then things suddenly blow up on you. But hey, you'll 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 recover and you'll figure something out, and then you'll move from there. Uh, so I don't know that uh, Paulson's proposal Paulson's proposals I I kind of uh, like them, uh, but I think that they're not enough. That's why I'm writing a book about this. I think. There's a lot more to be done. But even if you did everything that I would do, we would still have a vulnerability to financial crises. And part of the reason why I'm endorsing this uh, market stability regulator uh, is that I think that there's no way that we can just guarantee, there's no way we can set up a system that is both very effective in allocating resources and that is also, um, that is also very stable. Uh, so. You know, just like when we went to the moon, when <laughs> we sent people up into space, one of those space shuttles blew up. Well, that's what happens. Uh, but most of them made it all right. So um, uh, that's the way it is in, in finance as well. So anyway, I I'm, I'm here to talk today about uh, investment banking, uh, which of course is relevant. To, uh, this is all part of this general thing. But I w uh, uh, let me. Um, I said earlier that investment banking seems to be a great interest of students at Yale. Uh, that's because they get some really great jobs there. Uh, it's a uh, investment banking is a very important economic institution, and it's fundamental. What they do is fundamental to what happens in our economy, and so uh, as a result, uh, people who work for them have a chance uh, for a great economic success. I'm not saying you want a job at an investment bank, <laughs> because it's also uh, uh, demanding and difficult. And uh, I, I've talked to some of our students who've been taking jobs at investment banks, and uh, sometimes I think they're probably too demanding. As a young person, you should be enjoying your youth and <laughs> not, not getting dragged in to some huge investment bank. And some, there are some terrible stories. Young people who took, uh, who left uh, a college five, ten years ago, and they got a job at Bear Stearns, 
Uh, and uh, Bear Stearns demanded, I'm just making this story up, but it must be something like this for somebody, demanded 80-hour, 100-hour week devotion to the job, but they kept paying in Bear Stearns stock. <laughs> and the, ex the student was making millions every year. Uh, meanwhile, uh, was, uh, his youth was going away. <laughs> and uh, now th uh, this imaginary student is now 33 years old, never had time to marry or have a <laughs> start a normal life. And then the whole thing blows up, and all the Bear Stearns stock is worth just about nothing. Uh, so that's the kind of mistake you don't want to make. Uh, I, I find the industry very interesting. You have to form some kind of balance in your life and not let anyone demand 100 hours a week of your time. Uh, and if they do, you should sell the stock they give you as soon as you can <laughs> and diversify. Uh, but I also like investment banking because I've uh, created one. We have uh, uh, my colleagues and I founded an investment bank called Macro Markets. Uh, and I'm not actually running it. I'm uh, co -fi It's named after a book I wrote called Macro Markets. Uh, and we're not a very big or important bank yet, but it makes me interested in the whole field. Uh, uh, we have only hired one Yale student so far, because <laughs> we're too tiny, uh, to, so we're not hiring, in case you wonder. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, it was a student in this class that we hired, but again, that's, uh, that's all history. So. Um, so anyway, uh, what is investment banking, which is the subject of this? Uh, investment banking uh, means the underwriting of securities. There's, uh, that is arranging for the issuance by corporations of stocks and bonds. So the, the term bank is misleading because uh, we often use it I'm writing over here, a depository institution uh, is an institution that accepts deposits uh, and makes loans uh, or invests the money from the deposit. Do you know what I mean by a deposit? If you go to a savings bank or a savings and loan or a commercial bank and you say, I want to open up a checking account, that's a deposit. Or I want to open up a savings account, that's a deposit. Okay, the, the thing about a deposit is you deposit your money as an individual, and there are millions of people that all deposit uh, in, in a depository institution. And then uh, later on, whenever you want, you can take your money out. Meanwhile, they in invest the deposits some way or another at a higher interest rate than they pay on the deposit. And they make the difference, and that's how they make a profit. So I often use the word bank to refer, and, and so does everyone, to a depository institution. But if you look at what the uh, law says, they tend to use the word depository institution. An investment bank, if it's doing a pure investment banking business, is not a depository institution. So if you go into an investment bank and say, I want to open up a deposit, they'll say, you should go next door to the credit union <laughs> or something. We don't do that. Uh, so the word bank is somewhat misleading. Uh, on the other hand, historically, most institutions uh, uh, do both. I if you go around the world, uh, most banks, most depository institutions are also involved in investment banking. But let me just write under here. Investment banking does underwriting of securities. And what does that mean? That means they they uh, arrange for the issuance by other institutions of securities. So if, for example, if Ford Motor Company wants to uh, issue corporate bonds or they want to issue new shares, they would go to an investment bank and the investment bank would say, okay, we can underwrite for you, but we'll do it for you. So, uh, uh, so a pure investment bank uh, is not a depository institution, and it's also a pure investment bank is not a broker-dealer either. They're not trading in securities, they're although they would, they would deal in securities as a 
part of the underwriting process, but they're not. Uh, you wouldn't go to an investment, a pure investment bank either, and say, "I want to buy 100 shares of Ford Motor Company." <laughs> Where's your stockbroker? They wouldn't be dealing with that. They would. They deal. Their customers are companies, uh, and uh, they wouldn't uh, do that either. Now, but in many cases, firms do a mixture of different activities. One of which is investment banking. But there's a peculiar um, ex uh, story that refers particularly to America, the United States, and that is the Glass-Steagall Act uh, of 1933. Again, you see everything happened in the 30s. Uh, the stock market crash in 1929 caused tremendous chaos in the financial markets, and uh, Carter Glass. Uh, was a senator from Virginia, and he and I think it's Henry Steagall uh, put together a bill which passed Congress and was signed by President Roosevelt uh, that said that uh, <coughs> we want to um, make a, a law saying that investment banks uh, cannot be combined with commercial banks or insurance. Investment banking had to be a separate firm, okay? This is what they said in 1933. You could not be both a depository institution and an investment bank. So they said, after this act, every bank has to choose one or the other. Do you want to be investment bank or commercial bank? So for example, then, J.P. Morgan in the United States was founded by a man named James Pierpont Morgan. Uh, and it was one of the biggest banks in the U.S. Uh, in 1933, it was told, you got to make a choice. Uh, are you an investment bank or a commercial bank? Uh, and so J.P. Morgan made a choice uh, and said, well, we'll go to be commercial bank. And so they stopped their investment banking business uh, in 1933. They've since gotten back into it. but. Uh, that's the, but for a long time, they became a commercial bank. So what happened, they had a lot of people at J.P. Morgan who were doing investment banking, uh, and they, um, uh, they uh, uh, were upset because J.P. Morgan was shutting them down. So uh, there was a Mr. Stanley, I forget his first name now, <laughs> uh, who was, I, I mentioned him because he was a Yale graduate. <laughs> and uh, he got the guys together from J.P. Morgan who did investment banking. Um, and uh, J.P. Morgan was dead already, but uh, his son, the young Morgan, uh, and he created Morgan Stanley. Okay. I, I have the suspicion that uh, Mr. Stanley put uh, the son of J.P. Morgan on just for the prestige of the name. Sounds a lot better, right? Morgan Stanley? Uh, and so this became an investment bank. Okay, and now J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley are, you know, uh, over seven, seventy-five years later, are competitors. <coughs> so, uh, so that that is the important history uh, of uh, Glass Steagall. Um, but the problem is that as the years went on. Uh, in the U.S., we had a division between investment banking and commercial banking, but in Europe uh, and in other places of the world, there, uh, banks were under no such restriction. So there was a lot of complaints that uh, our laws in the U.S. were handicapping the uh, U.S. banks, uh, and uh, so uh, finally, Glass-Steagall was repealed, uh, and. Uh <coughs> That didn't happen until 1999. So we have the Graham whoops, Leach Lilly, if I'm spelling this right, Act of 1999, which repealed uh, uh, Glass Steagall. Uh, and so that led then to a whole wave of mergers. Of investment banks, uh, so J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley could presumably have merged, but they didn't. <laughs> uh, they've become too much competitors. 
uh, and they and uh, they they just develop their own. Uh, they just uh, internally adopted more broad uh, definition of their business. Um, so, uh, but there's lots of mergers that we can talk about that came uh, either sometimes they occurred just before 1999, uh, but um, uh, which uh, 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 so for example. Um, uh, and this, uh, the, the new uh, Graham-Leach um, bill also allowed insurance companies to merge with commercial banks. So Travelers Insurance uh, and Citigroup merged uh, in 1998. I know that's before the bill. That was as the bill was just about to happen. Um, and then uh, J.P. Morgan uh, and Chase. Uh, merged in um, uh, 2000, uh, and then uh, UBS uh, and um, uh, Payne Weber um, merged in 2000, uh, and uh, Credit Suisse, a, a Swiss bank. And uh, Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jen Rett Donaldson was the uh, dean of our business school here at SOM. But that merger occurred in 2000. So, uh, so those are some examples. So now we're we're seeing a movement back toward uh, so that. It, it, a bank has an investment banking business within it, but it's not just an investment bank. Uh, and so, uh, it's sometimes hard to define what something is. There's been a, a lot of news just in the last year, or even more recently, like yesterday or like tomorrow, this morning's paper, about investment banks, because under the current financial crisis, uh, they are buckling. They're, a lot of them are in trouble, uh, and that's why it's big news. Uh, so I'll give you some examples. Um, I, mentioned, I mentioned Bear Stearns. Um, so uh, Bear Stearns uh, was founded in 1923 by uh, uh, Joseph Baer and Robert Stearns. Uh, I try to find something out about them, and they don't seem to be very well known. I couldn't. Uh, they're not on the web. There's no Bear Stern. There's no Joseph Bear admirer club <laughs> on the web. But whatever they set up was really big for a while. So uh, we say from 1923 to 2008 when it went bust. So it lasted uh, 85 years. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it has investment banking business, but it also has private equity business and private banking, uh, and uh, it started to get in trouble during the current. In fact, it was maybe the first uh, U.S. investment bank to get in trouble in in the current financial crisis because it was in um, uh, June of 2007. Uh, they had uh, some of their funds collapsed. They 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 had funds that were investing in in subprime mortgages, uh, and th this is a sign of something wrong. The names of these funds were uh, the Bear Stearns High Grade Structured Credit Fund. You know what they say? High grade. You know what high grade is supposed to mean in finance? That it's not going to fail on you, right? <laughs> well, uh, and they had uh, they had another one called. The Bear Stearns High Grade Structured, Structured Credit Enhanced Leverage Fund. Now that sounds a little bit like a contradiction. You should, as a consumer of financial products, wonder when they put both high grade and leveraged in the same name, right? 
High grade is supposed to mean safe, but leverage sounds like the opposite, doesn't it? If you leverage means that they borrowed a lot of money to buy risky subprime securities. So if, if they borrowed 80% of the money, the securities only have to lose 20% of the value for you to be wiped out. Right? So that shouldn't be high grade if it's so leveraged. So anyway, these two funds were wiped out. Um, and uh, Bear Stearns had to give uh, a th um, deal out uh, $3.2 billion. That was last summer. But they, the news kept getting worse and worse. Apparently, Bears had invested a lot in securities that were uh, unstable. And so it finally became where rumors started developing that Bear was. It was really rumors that killed Bear. The rumors started going that, you know, Bear is in trouble, and so they're, you're gonna be, they're gonna be in bankrupt before long. This is exactly the market stability problem that uh, Paulson is talking about. Once the rumors get started, everybody is saying, don't, don't do anything with Bear. Don't, don't lend them any money. Don't, uh, just stay away from them. Even young people who are getting jobs, and they were right to, st right to think this, don't even take a job with them, because you're going to be on the street again shortly. So it's that kind of rumor that killed Bear Stearns. Uh, and so they couldn't, uh, they couldn't pay their bills, and, they, and they, <coughs> they were finding it difficult to sell their assets to come up with money. Uh, and so uh, the Fed decided to bail them out. This was a huge Fed bailout. Well, they didn't want, uh, the Fed didn't want to uh, uh, bail out the stockholders. They didn't want to just give money to people who would inv invest, because firms are supposed to be allowed to fail. So what the Fed did is it gave a line of credit to J.P. Morgan, a non-recourse line of credit, to buy Bear Stearns. And what it amounted to was that the Fed would take uh, troubled uh, securities that Bear Stearns couldn't sell. It would take that as collateral for a $29 billion loan to J.P. Morgan. Uh, under the condition that J.P. Morgan would buy Bear Stearns, and it was supposed to be at two dollars a share, uh, and so that left the total value of Bear Stearns at a little over two hundred million, uh, which is pretty tiny compared to what they were worth, uh, which was in the tens of billions a short while ago. Uh, but the the Fed didn't want a disorderly collapse, so uh, so it was a. Uh, a $29 billion loan to J.P. Morgan. This is highly controversial <laughs> these days because uh, 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 the Fed isn't normally doing this sort of thing. Why would it be lending money to J.P. Morgan to buy another company? You know, you say, how is that benefiting the, the average person in this country? Uh, but it does benefit them because if they didn't do this, Bear Stearns would have dumped its assets on the ma market. Uh, it would go down in flames. Uh, lots of its debts would become. Uh, lots of people who had, uh, you know, accounts with Bear Stearns would find that their accounts were destroyed. Uh, and uh, and then what would it do? It might lead to contagion to other financial institutions. People would say, "Well, it happened to Bear. Who's next?" And so there would be this huge pulling back. So the Fed decided to, to bail, bail them out, uh, and that's what they did. Now, it's not clear that it's over. <laughs> if you read this morning's paper, Lehman Brothers is another, uh, another uh, investment bank that uh, uh, is rumored to be in trouble, and so um, it's, it's got to do something about these rumors uh, because it can kill them kill them, just the rumors. No one wa will want to do anything with them. So it was in this morning's paper, or yesterday's news, that they have arranged to raise capital uh, on, the, on the markets. Uh, and it was not entirely clear. That means that they're, they're getting people who are willing to invest, give them money, uh, invest in the company. Uh, and it's a sign of confidence in Lehman Brothers that someone would do that at this critical time. Um, so another story that came in yesterday was UBS. I mentioned before it was a Swiss bank. 
Well, it's not Swiss, and it's international now. It started out uh, as the Union Bank of Switzerland. That's what it stands for, Union Bank of Switzerland, which was uh, uh, the result of a merger between two Swiss banks around 1900. Uh, but then it had, uh, I mentioned, merged uh, with uh, Payne Weber, and it's become an international corporation. So they, they just call themselves UBS. But in, in this morning's newspaper, uh, it said that um, UBS announced that it has lost, um, what was it? Uh, does anyone remember what the numbers were? What's that? They've lost 19 billion. So, uh, yeah, so that's a huge loss. $19 billion is a substantial part of their market cap. Um, but they are also announcing that they are arranging to raise capital as well. So, uh, the news that these firms, which are rumored to be in trouble, are managing to raise capital uh, buoyed markets yesterday. We had a big upsurge in the stock market. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, well, yesterday was the first day of the second quarter, and uh, newspapers were reporting <laughs> that it was the biggest uh, upsurge on the mark on the first day of a new quarter since 1938. Um, I looked at that with some curiosity because 1938 was not such a great year <laughs> after all. We were still in the Depression. Uh, I think uh, I have to look up, but the market didn't do great after that then. So uh, it doesn't, this doesn't predict much one way or the other. Um, but uh, um, so anyway, this is where we are now. It's an interesting situation. Uh, if you are thinking of taking a job at one of these companies, you might consider the uh, look at their uh, situation because some of these companies could uh, follow the way of of Bear Stearns um, at this point. Uh, we have the Fed aggressively lending and trying to prevent another thing. But you know, the Fed is not in the business of making sure that your career is a success. Uh, they're in the business of preventing a systemic failure. So while the Fed uh, arranged for an orderly dissolution of Bear Stearns, it didn't do a, a whole lot of good to uh, Bear employees. Who uh, We'll see what happens to all of them. I don't know the whole story, but um, uh, it's a tumultuous world out there. It's not, uh, it's not like you live in an academic environment where Yale University has been in business for over 300 years, and it looks so stable here. Well, this is a very stable business, <laughs> and these other businesses are not so stable. But anyway, I wanted to talk about the underwriting process and um, uh, what it's done. So uh, I think the underwriting of securities uh, is. Um, uh, it's analogous. The investment banking business is analogous to the business done by um, by ordinary commercial banks, in the sense that it deals with a moral hazard problem and an asymmetric information problem. We were talking about uh, inf about what banks do, commercial banks. Remember, I was telling the story that uh, the big problem. <laughs> With lending to companies, is that it's hard to tell whether they are really deserving of the loan or not, and so a commercial banker is someone who spends lives in a business community and keeps abreast of everything that's going on and plays golf with all the local business people and has a sense. Here's the gossip. Has a sense of who is responsible, who will pay back a loan, who's got a business that's really going, who's got a business that's sick and on the way out. Uh, and so that's what a bank does. So uh, everyone else who wants to invest doesn't know this, but they, they put their money in the bank, and then that's the idea. So the moral hazard is the moral hazard that the company uh, which, which receives a loan from the bank would take the money and run. And the asymmetric information problem is that uh, you as an investor, if you were to make loans directly to a company, you would um, be suffering at a disadvantage because you know less uh, than other people. Uh, you don't play golf with these people, and so you you would end up taking on the worst uh, loans, uh, loans that would fail. Well, the same thing applies to underwriting because 
uh, but they do it in a different way. Instead of uh, certifying, uh, instead of creating deposits at a bank, they, uh, they underwrite securities. And they are not taking the money. They're just an intermediary between you, the public, and the issuer of the security. But it's much the same thing. It's the reputation of the, uh, of the bank that uh, makes it possible for firms to uh, 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 makes it possible for firms to issue securities. So, th th so the uh, the underwriting process uh, is very important to understand uh, because uh, it's a process that allows uh, issuers of securities to uh, take advantage of the reputation of the underwriters. The issuer of the security may not be so well known or not so well understood. Uh, and so the, the, what happens is uh, the underwriter it's a little, what, what, what's a good analogy? I was, I was going to say it's like a dating service, but that, I guess dating services don't do this, right? <laughs> they, don't call, they don't testify to the moral character. Uh, they should. It would be nice. Do they do that? Does anyone do that? Uh, they probably can't, right? That's, a, that's an even bigger moral hazard problem. <laughs> when you're looking for a spouse, uh, you have a huge moral hazard problem, and there's nobody there to help you, as far as I know. <laughs> but at least in the business world, we have professionals. So they're matchmakers in a sense. They're trying to match up uh, a company that's issuing securities to buyers of the securities. Uh, and uh, this is an important reason for a difference between investment banking and other aspects of, um, of finance. Investment bankers, uh, well, compared particularly to traders, investment bankers um, like to um, cultivate an image of sober responsibility and good citizenship uh, because uh, they thrive on their reputation. And so they, in a, to be successful as an investment banker, you have to be so impressive uh, and so such high character <laughs> that companies like Ford and GM will come to you to represent them in the sale of their securities. So as a result, investment bankers tend to be well dressed. Uh, they tend to be uh, a patrician in their uh, appearances and manner. <laughs> and uh, in contrast, traders uh, tend to have uh, vulgar accents. They shout on the phone. They slam the phone down. <laughs> they roll up their sleeves. They, they dribble food on their shirt <laughs> and are maybe putting them down too much. Uh, so uh, uh, I personally think that we have a strength at Yale because of our patrician <laughs> image uh, in providing people to work for this field. So uh, typically, investment bankers uh, go to the symphony on Saturday night. But beyond that, if you open up the program at the symphony, you'll see their name under platinum sponsor <laughs> on the program. And so that's the kind of people that go into investment bank. And they do it because they have to manage this underwriting process well. So what is the underwriting process? Uh, okay, well, uh, what happens is a company that is thinking of issue, it's a, say you're at any company, a big company, it doesn't matter. Uh, People don't trust big companies even if they've been around 100 years. So if Ford Motor Company, it's been around since when? Uh, something like around 1900. But people sure don't trust it anymore because it's had a history of trouble. It's not a question just of morality or anything. It's a question of are you willing to buy their securities? So they would go to an investment banker and, uh, and say, we need money. We'd like to raise it uh, by, say, issuing shares in, in our company. and then. Um, the, uh, they would probably contact a number of investment banks uh, and try to make a, a, a deal. Now, th there's, um, there's two kinds of deals. There's a bought deal and a best efforts. Uh, the difference is uh, some investment bankers will tell the company, uh, we will, um, we will, you want to issue these shares, fine. Sell them to us. We'll, we'll take it. We'll give you a price. Of course, the investment bank doesn't want to hold these shares, but the investment bank 
knows the public well enough to know which shares it can sell. So in a, in a bought deal, the investment bank is taking the risk that they might not be able to sell the shares at a, at a decent price. They might lose on it. Uh, but uh, also, there's a different kind of offering, uh, which uh, uh, may be the best you could get. It's called a best efforts o offering. And here, the uh, investment banker will not buy the deal, but it will say that we will use our best efforts to place this. Uh, and uh, if you have a minimum price, uh, we hope we can get above that. Otherwise, the deal will fall through. Uh, and so, uh, the underwriting process. Um, uh, is uh, it takes the form of uh, uh, it's actually very much regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the process uh, is formalized. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, issue securities, you m uh, we're talking about public securities here. You have to register them with the SEC, and so the SEC then becomes a partner. In a partner <laughs> or an adversary in your effort to issue these securities. So the, the SEC, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. All this might be changed next year, who knows, but this is the way it is right now. Uh, so uh, the, the law says there's a pre filing period. You have to file with the SEC uh, to get uh, um, your, your securities effective. So the idea, uh, say Ford Motor Company wants to issue new sh shares, they go to the investment bank, uh, then the investment bank negotiates with the uh, uh, firm, with Ford, about what uh, kind of uh, securities it wants to issue and what price is reasonable. Uh, and during this period, the SEC uh, says there's no talk uh, to the public about the shares. Uh, um, at during this period, uh, no talk publicly. Uh, the, the, the SEC wants to manage the process so that everything is done appropriately. Uh, at this point, during the pre-filing period, the, uh, the investment bank forms a syndicate of other, uh, of other uh, in underwriters, and they, have, they sign an agreement among underwriters. Usually, one investment bank is not big enough to handle a, a big issue, and it wants to get help of other investment banks. And so they form a syndicate of underwriters during the pre-filing period. Uh, so uh, the underwriter, there's a lead underwriter, which uh, Ford Motor Company approached first, and, and the lead underwriter promise to take on the issue, uh, but the lead underwriter doesn't want to do it itself. And the reason it doesn't want to do it just itself is that in order to sell an issue to a broad public, you have to make use of a broad network of contacts with the public. And uh, no one underwriter, no one investment bank has, has them all. So they form a syndicate, a group of investment banks that um, that are all participating in the issue of the security, uh, and then they uh, then they file, and then there's a, what's called a cooling off period uh, when the uh, security is in registration. So they file with the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, a uh, prospectus for this or preliminary prospectus. This goes to the, Federal, to the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, for a, approval. Well, it's not really approval of the issue, but it's, it's um, uh, registration of the issue. Uh, and uh, the preliminary prospectus uh, is called the red herring. Uh, and uh, the red herring, uh, it's lost in history why they call it that. There's different theories about it. it uh, a herring, of course, is a type of fish. Uh, and the, the best uh, explanation 
that I can get for this name for the preliminary prospectus is that it was uh, referring to an activity that hunters used to do with dogs. Uh, I don't know if I should tell you these stories, but I'd like to know why they call it a red herring. Uh, if you have hunting dogs, they're, they're supposed to track down a, a fox by their sense of smell. Uh, and so at one, one pace you can put your dogs through is to try to, try to confuse them, and they would take a, a red herring, which is a very smelly kind of fish, and they would drag it around and on the, over the trail of the fox. And uh, it's very difficult for dogs to still smell the fox <laughs> over that smell. And so the word red herring became known as a euphemism for something trying to distract and confuse. And so it was a joke. I, I think it was a joke on Wall Street that the prospectus is really just there to try to confuse you. And so they called it the red herring. Um, but the preliminary prospectus is now often printed with red borders on it to, to indicate that it's the red herring, uh, and it's only preliminary. Uh, and so uh, finally, uh, the, the Fed evaluates the um, prospectus and makes sure that it accords with all regulations. It puts it up on its website uh, at the SEC while it's in registration. Uh, and again, during the cooling off period, uh, firms are allowed to circulate the preliminary prospectus. Underwriters are allowed to circulate the preliminary prospectus with uh, potential buyers, uh, but they're not supposed to say anything besides what's in the preliminary prospectus. They're, what they're concerned about, the SEC is concerned about people overselling securities. Uh, and so they might point out advantages of it and not the disadvantages. The idea of a prospectus, wh what's in a prospectus? A prospectus is a document that completely tells everything about a security. The whole idea of the SEC is that we're not letting anyone pull the wool over your eyes. That's why it really shouldn't be called a red herring. It's not supposed to deceive you. It's supposed to pour out everything about the security. One thing that's in a prospectus, a, a preliminary or final prospectus, is the company thinks of everything bad that could ever happen. If you read prospectuses, they'll say awful things. If you read them carefully, they'll say, this company could lose everything. We could be sued. We could be going to jail. We might have done all sorts of, I'm maybe exaggerating, but uh, the, the lawyers put everything that imaginable that could go wrong with this investment in there, and they do it. Of course, it's in kind of fine print, but it's all in there, so that it's disclosed. And so later, if someone loses money in the investment and wants to sue them, then they'll say, well, look, you know, it's in our prospectus. And the reason that the SEC doesn't want them to talk about securities at this point, except to give the prospectus, is so that they can't conceal and hide these things. So th this is the SEC process. The process says that the underwriters have to give out the prospectus, and that's all they can do. They can't have a separate brochure. They can't, your broker uh, can't say, well, we're, we're thinking of uh, issuing the security. Uh, we've got this prospectus, but I'm going to send you a brochure instead. That's easier. Okay. SEC says, no way. Because that brochure will be a sales job, and it won't have all of this in there. So anyway, then eventually the SEC approves it, uh, and when it's approved, then it's effective. Uh, and then, uh, then the uh, then the underwriters can start uh, selling the security. Uh, and at that point, uh, they actually it depends. Say it's a best efforts offering. Then they go around and they try to uh, they get. Uh, buyers of the security lined up. Now you have to understand that there's a problem issuing a new security. Securities that are already out there in trading, everybody knows about them, and, and there's, a, there's a market for them. But if you're issuing a new security, uh, especially there's, uh, if it's a company that is issuing shares for the first time, an IPO is an initial public offering. An IPO is the first time that a company issues shares. So the company is not known to the public. Uh, and so it's very hard to get IPOs started because the company is just not known. Uh, and so it's very important that the underwriters are able to get attention 
and get uh, a market going for the IPO. Um, during the uh, cooling off period, uh, uh, firms uh, also are allowed to place, according to the uh, SEC, something called a tombstone. And that is an ad in the newspaper uh, which will announce <coughs> the, the uh, security. And what it's a very dignified ad because it has to uh, meet with the approval of the Securities and Exchange Commission. But a tombstone will say, Ford Motor Company, um, uh, you know, one million shares uh, offered, uh, and then it will um, it will list all of the underwriting syndicate. So it'll be a, a list of all the um, investment banks that participated in the issue, um, and. Uh, so, um, so that's the basic process that underwriters go through to issue securities. Now, part of the thing is, uh, I, I just want to close with. Uh, basically, I think that uh, investment banks are very similar to impresarios <laughs> in what they do. They. But there's what I mean by an impresario is someone who manages a singer or a musician uh, in concerts, um, a, 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 uh, but it's a little different. <laughs> but uh, a um, underwriter is managing the career of a security, just like somebody else would be managing the career of a singer, and they're very concerned about the reputation, and they're very concerned about. Getting sold out performances <laughs> all the time. Now, one thing about IPOs is that uh, they are very hard to get a new security for a new company going because nobody knows this company. And so uh, the price movements of an IPO tend to be very volatile. Uh, and it's because of the difficulty in getting IPOs going, underwriters have peculiar practices. In issuing them, and it, it, it tends to go like this. Underwriters tend, and there's been a lot of documentation of this, to <coughs> underprice IPOs. That is, they sell them for less than they could get, uh, and that means that IPOs tend to be oversubscribed. Okay, uh, and this sounds strange. Why would it work this way? So you, you, you can try this. Call your broker, if you have a broker. <laughs> does anyone here have a broker? <laughs> Maybe somebody does. But think about this anyway. You could call a broker and, and inquire uh, and say, hey, I hear about IPOs. I'd like to get in on some. Okay? What do you think the broker will say? Well, the broker will say, OK, let me see what I can do for you, and he doesn't call you back. Uh, <laughs> And you wonder, well, why does this person not want my business? Uh, and, well, the reason is that you haven't been a good guy yet. You know, you haven't been giving the broker other business. Uh, and you hear stories about IPOs that did spectacularly well, uh, that jumped 30 percent on the first day, and you say, "Hey, I want that." Uh, but um, it becomes uh, a sort of a game they're playing. It's a little bit like trying to get tickets to some rare concert. Okay. I mean, people will sometimes, or, or there's a, someone coming to uh, Toads, who's, I don't, I don't go there, but <laughs> you know about this. <laughs> someone who's very famous is coming to Toads, right? And you have trouble getting tickets. Is that right? Does anything like this happen here? It happens somewhere anyway. And so you might end up standing in line for hours at the first time the ticket office opens, right? And then it sets up rumors going that, wow, uh, you know, this is a difficult concert to get into. Uh, and um, then people start trading the tickets afterwards, or someone out there asking more money than it says on the ticket. Well, you have to understand that that whole event was staged by an impresario, right? So there's someone who's responsible for the reputation of this performer, okay? And this guy says, there's no way that our performer is going to go in and perform to a half empty house. We've got to pack them in. We want people lining up on the streets because it, it gives a sense of excitement. That this person is a star, but you know this, right? These stars are managed, and they're not just spectacularly good singers. 
the, the impresario is critically important in maintaining the career of a singer, and the impresario is very concerned about appearances. And so you don't want to charge a really high price to get into toads because then it would only be wealthy people from the suburbs would be coming, and it would destroy the whole atmosphere <laughs> of the place, right? So you've got to charge reasonably low price tickets, uh, and then a lot of people will come flocking to you, uh, and then they'll create the excitement. Well, it, the underwriters do the same thing with IPOs, so they underprice them typically, and it creates this huge uh, excitement about can I get in on this IPO? Uh, and, um, and that excitement generates uh, more business. So, uh, and it also generates a reputation for the underwriter. People see the tombstone and they know that this, un this IPO uh, did extremely well. It jumped up you know, a high amount in the first day, and people think this underwriter is really something. I want to get in on other offerings of that underwriter. And so the reputation of the underwriter grows. So it's really a reputation business. And these people know something about investor psychology, and uh, you, you might consider it some kind of market manipulation. But it's all perfectly legal because the SEC allows this kind of thing. But uh, so th anyway, coming back to the, the problem that we're having now is that I, I'm emphasizing that investment bankers need a reputation. Th their whole business is a reputation business. And so when something happens to Bear Stearns, it's critical for the whole industry. And now when it's happening repeatedly to various other banks, uh, it becomes a, uh, a critical turning point. Uh, so the market, stock market went up a lot yesterday because of the encouraging news that some of these investment banks were able to raise more capital. Uh, and uh, it's an ongoing saga, but it's all a saga that's played out in terms of investment. Uh, and so I find it difficult to predict what's going to happen next. Uh, it's very hard to know. Um, right now, yes, as of yesterday, we had some encouraging news, but this is something that we'll just have to keep watching. I think this will play out over years. This thing is not going to be over tomorrow. So we'll have more interesting things to talk about later this semester, and uh, there will be things to watch uh, <laughs> to follow up on over the years. Okay, so we're going to talk next period about investment management.